welcome you to Jesus' is Lord Outreach Center. We're going to continue to worship the Lord as we bring up our tithes and offerings to Him. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you. We lay up in a store as you prosper us. We bring up tithes, offerings to you. As we sow, we know we reap. We thank you that you're causing all grace to abound toward us, that we have all sufficiency in all things, and may be able to abound to every good work. Father, we thank you for meeting the need of every individual, not only in this place, but those at home and other cities or nations of the world, as they're bringing their tithes or offerings unto you. Father, thank you for meeting all of our need according to your riches and glory. By Christ Jesus, in Jesus' name. Amen. Usher, please wait on the people if you would. Praise God. We have one announcement concerning this week. Coming up this Friday is the first Friday of the month, and there's opportunity for you to get involved in preaching the gospel. The first Friday festival, the first Friday festival this Friday, it's going to be um, if you haven't got on the email list, we have sent out the information this afternoon. And if you're not on the email list, let us know. Opportunity for you to preach the gospel in the first Friday festival, Friday. And we have a loudspeaker system and we have all of our tracks. And it's an opportunity for you to reach people that need Jesus Christ. Praise God. So that's this coming Friday. If you're not on the email list, again, come and see me. And we'll be able to still send that out to you for this week. We're going to pray for all men, pray for our nation. Father, we pray for all men, including all those that will be coming to this Friday night festival. Father, we thank you that you are reaching the multitudes, all these people, with the gospel. Thank you for drawing those ones. Thank you, Father, for the labors being sent forth all over the world as well to preach the gospel. Thank you for the word sown in the hearts and minds of the multitudes, bringing revelation, opening the eyes of the understanding of them bringing them to the place of realizing what Jesus has accomplished, that he has accomplished the redemption, made the way of reconciliation to the Father by the exchange, by receiving a new spirit, getting a new spirit and a new heart by when you receive Jesus. Thank you for bringing them to this place, and they would act upon it, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, receive him, be born from above, and follow the word of God all the days of their life. Father, we also continue to pray for this nation. We bind every evil spirit. We thank you and praise you that you are at work to accomplish what you purpose. We declare that you are at work to accomplish your purpose for this nation. We remit the sins of this nation. We bind all the principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual weakness, cast them down, throw them down, root them out. We thank you for bringing righteous leaders. We thank you for those leaders that are not of you, bringing them to the place of repentance or removing them. Father, we thank you for doing whatever is necessary to accomplish what your purpose and delivering us from evil. Thank you, Father, that we are your people who are called by your name, who do humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways because we do so and meet the conditions. We know that you hear from heaven. You forgive us our sins. You heal our land. Our eyes are on you. Thank you for accomplishing what you purpose for this nation. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God for what he is doing. Stand with me if you would. We're going to pray as we get into God's Word. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your Word. It is the truth. Thank you for the revelation that you're bringing forth. Thank you for all that you accomplished this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We're sharing with you on the subject of understanding the doctrine of baptisms. It is an important subject to understand not only for understanding the truth, but because of the fact that there has been so much wrong teaching regarding this and misunderstanding, unfortunately. We have pointed out, and just review a few things. Hebrews 6, 1, therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine, this word here means the logos, which is the word of Christ, let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, and of the doctrine of baptisms. Doctrine means the teaching. It's the word teaching of baptisms. Notice it is plural. There are three baptisms that are mentioned in the scripture. There's John's baptism. There's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And there is baptism with water. 
which we will be going through all of these through this series. Now we pointed out also that even though there's a doctrine of baptisms, a very important scripture to understand in Ephesians 4, where it lists out all these things that are spiritual things. In Ephesians 4, there's one body, one spiritual body, the body of Christ, one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, which is a spirit of faith, one baptism. And notice when we get to the word one on one baptism, it is a different Greek word, as we have pointed out each time. It's mia, meaning only one baptism. Why would it say that? Because it's stressing the fact that there's only one spiritual baptism that has effect in a person's life. The other baptisms point towards things or are the, the result of the spiritual baptism. But there's only one that accomplishes this work of a spiritual baptism and what, it's, what it accomplishes in our life. Now, we pointed this out before, but I think I need to bring it up again. Because of this subject, and there's been so much confusion, what, how are we going to find out the truth? Number one, we look to the source, which is the Word. It's going to give us the revelation. Number two, we also must realize the Holy Spirit is going to lead us and guide us into all truth and he will do so as we rely on him. Number three, we must realize that all of the scriptures fit together like pieces in a jigsaw puzzle, and therefore there are no contradictions in scripture whatsoever. If we see a scripture that is contradictory to a belief we've had, then there's got to be some error with us, or we're not understanding a scripture accurately. And another thing that we pointed out is this is a classic study of approaching a subject as if you know nothing. Not out of preconceived notions or a belief or knowledge that you have gained in the past. The reason being is because most people, when they think of baptism, they think of baptism, they think of water baptism. And most people, when they think of repent, they think of repenting of sins. And most people, when they think about remission, they're thinking about the forgiveness of their own personal sins. Not so. Well, you're going to find that you cannot think that that's what it means in every case because you have to look at the exact context about what it is. And we've been doing that. We also must look at the Greek text, the tense, the voice, the mood. And we also have to examine things that are prepositions because the prepositions are important and if they haven't been translated properly, then we won't have a true understanding. We also must look at the context. The context is extremely important, so we come up with knowing exactly what's said, and we got to, of course, know, see what these Greek uh, tenses of these verbs are, because they are very revealing. Now, we covered many things. We saw this doctrine of baptisms, yet there's only one spiritual baptism. We did discuss about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is the one spiritual baptism that brings us into the body of Christ. It is important to understand this. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into. Ice is the, is the preposition. Means motion into, coming into one body. What's the body? The body of Christ. That's how do we come into the body of Christ? When we're born again. So what does this tell us? The baptism by the Holy Spirit is that which is, get, causes us to come into the body of Christ, meaning the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the born again experience. That is when we get born again. Has that been taught in the body of Christ? Only in the fundamentalist standpoint. They've understood this because they believe this scripture as it says. But when you come to the full gospel, charismatic, word of faith, people that have believed that they believe that there has been an experience beyond being born again, and they have called it primarily the baptism of the Holy Spirit, saying that once you've been born again, have you been baptized with the Holy Spirit since then? That is error. That is false, because there's only one spiritual baptism, as we saw. This has caused people to be to deceived about this in full gospel circles. Now, when we look at the word baptize, remember it is a Greek word, baptizo. Well, that tells you it. They just made an English word out of it, but it doesn't tell you what it means. 
Baptizo, they made it baptize or baptism. What does it mean? It means to immerse, submerge, or engulf in something. And we also pointed out that it's been also refers to a washing. We didn't point this out this time, but we'll go back and show you quickly. Hebrews 6, verse 2, when it speaks of the word baptismos, it is translated washing three of the four times because that's actually what it means. It means a washing. And we're talking about a spiritual washing as, well as the one spiritual washing that it has effect that it has in our life. Now, another thing we pointed out is that water baptism is not necessary to produce the new birth. We saw that because we pointed out about the thief on the cross who we called him Lord. He, he was going to be with him in paradise, remember he said, but he was not baptized of water. Neither, neither were any of the Old Testament saints in the upper compartment of uh, the hell, which was Abraham's bosom, the place of comfort for the righteous ones who had died in the Old Testament. They got born again. The gospel was preached to the spirits in prison, and they got born again. It was preached to those who were dead. And they got born again. Did they get baptized? No. And so yet they were saved and went to heaven. So we show, that shows us that it's not of a necessity for someone to go to heaven. At the same time, we also saw over at Cornelius' house, without going through the scriptures again, but first they got born again, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit when they heard words that were given. Then they received the Holy Spirit. Then they spoke with tongues. And after that, then they got baptized with water after that. Meaning that baptism with water has nothing to do with getting born again or receiving the Holy Spirit or speaking in tongues. Baptism with water is something that is necessary for Christians. We'll be talking about that when we get to that and why, what it signifies before God. We've talked a little bit about it, but we'll be talking about that more, but not this evening. Now, we also <coughs> mentioned the fact that baptism, water baptism, was not Paul's priority. Remember, he said, Christ didn't send me to baptize. He sent me to preach the gospel for people to get born again. What is the first thing that should happen for people? They need to get born again, receiving Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. Now... We also talked about the subject of remission, which we will talk about for a moment, and we also talked about why, why it's important to understand what remission of sins is, because he was speaking about this remission that was going to come, and it refers to being delivered from being a sinner and being in bondage to sin, which we'll look at in just a moment. But one of the things we have to realize is that what was the state of man after he got after he had died after in the Old Testament era. He was destined for hell. Nobody could go to heaven until Jesus came. Even the righteous ones went to hell in the upper compartment, the place of comfort, which was Abraham's bosom. We've talked about all of these things in the past. Now, we want to discuss this remission for a moment. And we talked about Acts 2.38. We're going to go over that for a few minutes before we move on tonight. It's important to understand what this is all about. In Acts chapter 2, in verse 38, here is where Peter, preaching the gospel on the day of Pentecost, Peter, it says in the King James, said unto them, Repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Most all Christians have thought this is talking about water baptism. There are two sides to it. There are those that thought, thinks that this is talking about water baptism for those that have already been born again. And there are others that have thought that it's water baptism to produce a remission of sins, thinking that that's a forgiveness of sins. Both of those are error, as we have pointed out. First of all, we need to realize what produces a change in us to get born again. It is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Remember in Acts chapter 1, when Jesus was about to go to heaven, 
He told them to wait for the promise of the Father in Acts 1.4. In verse 5, John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence, showing there there's going to be a new type of a baptism. This is a baptism with the Holy Spirit. It hadn't occurred yet. When did it occur then? In a few days, which was when? The day of Pentecost. Well, how did this occur? And by the way, we need to go back for a moment and again, just point out, think for a moment, the word baptize means to immerse or submerge in something. Don't think water. In fact, in this case, it doesn't even say it's water. It says in the Holy Spirit. So it's to immerse or submerge in the presence of the Holy Spirit. So we go to chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and filled all the house where they were sitting. As we pointed out, if a rushing mighty wind came into this place and filled this entire place where we are sitting, what would that effectively do? We would all be immersed, submerged, and engulfed in the presence of this rushing mighty wind. Well, that's the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit coming in, they were immersed, submerged, engulfed, baptized with the Holy Spirit in verse 2. And what happens? Remember, by one spirit are we baptized into one body. This is when they got born again. The next verse. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. This is again a type of the Holy This is again a type of the Holy Spirit. And it sat upon epi, which means that they came upon them. This is how they come to into them. Epi refers to that which comes upon and it is a superposition upon one where he becomes joined to that particular one. And that's what happened. This is the Holy Spirit being received, coming to dwell on the inside of him. And we looked at the many scriptures about Epi where it talks about how we come into the Lord and how we come in unity with him and also how we receive the Holy Spirit. It used the word Epi many times as we saw the last time we were together. And then the next verse, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak with other tongues, the Spirit gave them utterance. First thing that happened, a baptism of the Holy Spirit. They got born again. Second thing that happened, they received the Holy Spirit. Third thing that happened, they got filled with the Holy Spirit, and then they began to speak with other tongues. Now, Peter, in verse 12, gets up after they had said in verse 14, it stands up here, begins to preach to them because they got their attention, God got their attention because the tongues that were coming forth were in all the different dialects of all the people that were there. And they were Galileans and they didn't know them and yet they were speaking of the wonderful works of God. And boy, this got their attention. Verse 14, this is where Peter stood up and began to preach to them. And in the midst of preaching to this, he said, first of all, this is what Joel spoke of. He's talking about the fulfillment of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And we come down to verse 21, and he says, It shall come to pass, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So he's talking about the people calling on the name of the Lord, which produces salvation. Notice this has nothing to do with water baptism. It's calling on the name of the Lord. When we call on the name of the Lord, what happens? There is a, a immersing in the presence of the Holy Spirit and we get born again. He goes on and speaks about how, remember they thought Jesus, they thought he was being judged by God. They thought he was being judged by him and punished by him and they didn't believe who he was whatsoever. Well, he comes and corrects them. He says, you men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man approved of God among you by miracles and signs, wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. This is what this guy did. He's reminding him of this. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you've taken by wicked hands of crucified and slain. He's telling him what he did to him. And then they tell him what God did. 
whom God, having raised up, having loosed the pains of death, otherwise he was resurrected. It was not possible that he should be holden of it. And then we come down, and he speaks of how he was in hell, and he came up out of it. And then we come down here to verse, after speaking of the resurrection, he speaks in verse 36, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly, God hath made that same Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. He's bringing the truth to them to correct them of what they had believed. Now when they heard us, they were pricked in their heart. They were convicted of the truth. And said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, at this point, we need to look at the next verse. It says, Then Peter said to them, when it says said, this is critical to look at the Greek text to find out what's being said and also the time sequence of the events. The word said is in the imperfect tense. This is very important because the imperfect tense in the Greek is a past tense. But it is a past tense denoting continuous action in the past. In other words, the way you would translate this correctly is Peter was saying to them continually. In other words, it records here in verse 38 that Peter was saying in the past to them. So that would be prior to the time of when we see when they finally came to the place of what shall we do. The reason being is because you'll find the things that he was telling them were the things that they were supposed to do, and now they were saying, what shall we do? So what was he telling them that they were to do in the past, continually? Repent, which means to change the mind. This is not talking about repenting of sins. This is talking about changing your mind towards Jesus, of who he was, and understanding what happened, because that's the context. And... Then he all, this is a command to them, by the way. They're commanded to change their mind, imperative mood. And then he says, and be baptized. This is what he said in the past to them. A command again, be baptized. Every, each, every one or each one of you. And this is a passive voice this time. That means it's going to be done by somebody else. And we'll find that this is done by God. This is talking about the baptism by the Holy Spirit, as you will see. Be baptized, each one of you, not in. This is a great mistake. Instead, it is the word epi. And the word epi is very important to see here. When we look at this particular word epi here, this is important to understand because... This word means upon, normally, but it even has a more meaning than just epi. When we look at epi here, and we look at what follows, it happens to be a dative case. It's a dative case. The reason why it's important, because epi can be in the genitive, has a genitive to it, it can have a dative to it, or it can have an accusative case to it. The genitive is the genitive, that's the case of possession. The dative is like an indirect object. The accusative is like a direct object in the Greek normally. So this one is the dative. When we look at the dative, this will mean primarily because of or on the basis of something. And we pointed out from E.W. Bullinger's Companion Bible, who gives the meanings of these Greek prepositions, he gives the fact that epi means superposition, which means to place one thing upon another to coincide with it or to be joined to it, especially, he says, in the dative case, it's an actual superposition or joining to it or putting upon, coinciding with it. So, this is a command for them to be baptized, each of you. And when would this occur? Upon or when this coinciding or joining to another, which would be joining to the Lord, and how would that happen? About the name of Jesus Christ. Because who do we call upon to be saved? 
the name of Jesus. So he's talking about, he's commanding before you're to be baptized to coincide and be joined unto upon the name of Jesus. And remember this also because it's dative refers to because of the name of Jesus. Well, what would that mean? You're going to be joined to it because of the name of Jesus that you did what? That you called upon in response to what he already told them to do. When you call upon the name of the Lord, what happens? You get saved. And then what will that produce? This is the word here where it says for, but it really is the word ice, which means into. And the word ice, meaning into, is referring to motion into something. It generally means motion into or motion unto or motion toward. It's coming into something. So this is talking about coming into, not the, the, but a remission of sins, as Young's brings out. Now, that means he's commanding them, repent, change your mind about Jesus. You're going to be baptized upon and because of the union and the coinciding and joining because of and on the basis of the name of Jesus Christ that you are told to call upon, that you're going to be calling upon if you obey, <laughs> that is going to bring you into a remission of sins. Now, what's this remission about? We talked about this. This means a release from bondage or imprisonment. A release from bondage or imprisonment. And this is important to understand. This release from bondage or imprisonment, we talk about this is the fact that there has been a, a freedom from the state that we were in before. And the reason we say that, because this has a little bit deeper understanding when we click on this particular word that it's the form, what it's beyond, um, from, meaning to send, and also this word apo. Apo means of a state of separation. We lost it a little bit. Of a state of separation. And it also refers to any kind of separation of one thing from another by the union or fellowship of the two is destroyed. In other words, it's like a separation from something. So, this is talking about the effect of the name of Jesus, which brings them to the place of being born again and saved, brings them into this place of the separation of something because of its destruction. Well, what gets destroyed? the spiritual state that we were in before, which was what? Being a sinner, being under bondage to sins. In other words, as it says here, being in bondage or imprisonment to sins. Now, why are we in bondage and imprisonment to sins? Because everybody's a sinner before they get born again. That's why they continually sin, and they're in that state. That's why some, what's the only answer? You have to get a new spirit. That's the only way to come out from being a sinner and in bondage or imprisonment of sins throughout your life. And that's what it produces. This is not talking about the forgiveness of sins. It's a different word for the believer. This is talking about the release from bondage or imprisonment of sins of mankind, which happens when they get baptized by the Holy Spirit upon and because of on the basis of the name of Jesus Christ that they've been joined to because they called upon the name of the Lord. This is what he's commanding them in the past they were to do. So what would happen then? They'd be born again. And then when you're born again, then what? Then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You can only receive the gift of the Holy Ghost after you're born again. So this would talk about being born again. Now, People have thought that, well, this means they already were born again at this point. No, they couldn't have been. Why? Because Peter was saying to them, remember, this means they hadn't responded to it yet. How do we know? 
It goes on down to verse 41. This is tell you when they responded to it. Then they that gladly received, this is the word apodectomy, abecdecomai. Decomai means to accept. Remember we've told you in the past there's two words for receive. One is lombano, a self-prompted act of taking hold of. The other one is decomai, which is a passive reception where you're accepting something that comes to you. What they do? They accepted his word. What happens when you accept the word of God? That's when the baptism of the Holy Spirit would occur. That's what happened at Cornelius' house. We see it said they received his word, and what happened? They were baptized, passive voice at that point in time, which is what? The baptism of the Holy Spirit occurred when we received the word. And again, we know that this receiving of the word, it produces that because remember what happened at Cornelius' house. If you weren't here for this, you need to see this. It speaks of that through his name, which is what we call upon, whosoever believeth into, into him, which is what we're doing when we believe on him, call upon his name, receives this release from bondage and imprisonment of sins because he's no longer a sinner. He gets a brand new spirit, the spirit of Jesus Christ. And when Peter spoke those words telling him that, the Holy Ghost fell on all those. Otherwise, when they heard that word, what happened? They got baptized with the Holy Spirit. And this is the thing that he referred to in rehearsing this to what happened with the apostles or the other uh, disciples at Jerusalem. He said, Who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved? And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. How did it fall on them at the beginning? The rushing mighty wind came in and immersed the whole place, and they all got born again, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we know this is that because he says so the next verse. Then I remember the word of the Lord, how he said, Jot indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. That means when words were spoken about being saved, tell the words, were but I and the house will be saved. He began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them. That was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So when you hear and you receive the word and you believe it, then you get born again. For as much as then God gave the life gift as he did to us who believe upon epi, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is talking about the new birth and the baptism of the Holy Spirit is what that's talking about. It's talking about Change your mind, repent, and be baptized by the Holy Spirit upon the name of Jesus because of it on the base of that that you called upon unto the place of the destruction of the state that you were in, the remission, release from bondage and imprisonment of being a sinner and bound to sins forever because you get a brand new spirit. That was what it talked about, and it uh, they received that in Acts 2, 41. That is important to understand what happened. That is one aspect of what John was talking about because he talked about this baptism of repentance unto remission of sins. And we took the time to look at that extensively in the past. Now, we're going to move on tonight and we're going to talk about the next aspect of what he brought forth to them. The next aspect that he brought to them is the fact that there was going to be a new way coming into the priesthood. We see, first of all, in Matthew chapter 3. Here's John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness. What's he say? Repent ye. Change your mind, repent means. It doesn't, you can't read into it about sins. He said, just simply change your mind. Why, why, why would that be? You've got to change your mind about what's going on here so that they're going to think correctly. For the kingdom, the rule and the reign of the heavens, it's plural, has come near. He's announcing this to them. Perfect tense means it has 
completed action from the past with present results now, meaning that's why it has come nigh. It has come near. Well, what's that mean? The kingdom's coming. And later on, actually, if we go over to Mark's account, and we see here in verse 15, it speaks, saying, the time is fulfilled. The time, it says, is the fixed and definite time. What fixed and definite time? The time that was already declared, that had to come to pass, that had to be fulfilled before the kingdom of God would come in to be nigh. What was that? Well, that was Daniel's prophecy of the 70 weeks. 69 weeks from the time of the decree, which was the, the decree by in, in uh, uh, Artaxerxes in 458 BC, 483 years elapsed until 26 AD, which is when this is, and the time being fulfilled, now Jesus is going to manifest, which means the Messiah is going to come. In fact, if you go back, just look at one verse in Daniel, without going through all this, Daniel, chapter 9, verse 25. Look what it says. Know ye therefore and understand the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto who? Messiah, uh, that's the anointed one, the ruler, prince, which is the ruler, which means his kingdom would come. He's beginning to rule, would be this period of time. So his rule now has come. It's come nigh. Well, what would that mean to them? Well, that means that not only is Jesus coming to do something, he's to bring forth not only this kingdom, which was the spiritual kingdom in the manifestation, to do something about the state they were in, which is to accomplish the redemption and set them free, but also it was important for them to realize they were going to come now into the priesthood. Why was that? Because of the fact that over in, in uh, I go back over to Exodus, the prophecy that was given, Exodus chapter 19. There was a prophecy in verse 5 and 6. It says, Now therefore, if you'll obey my voice, keep my covenant, you'll be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be. This is said to all of the Israelites, not just to the tribe of Judah, or excuse me, to the tribe of Levi who were priests. This is to all of them. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests. Well, if the kingdom has come, that means they're all going to be priests. So what was the news to these guys? The news was everybody is going to become a priest. So what does that mean? No, well, they all are going to come out and get ready for the priesthood. There were certain steps that were required to become a priest in the Old Testament. Mark 1, 5, they went out unto him, all the land of Judea, everybody, not just the tribe of Levi, but all of them, and they of Jerusalem, and they were all baptized of him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, why were they doing this? Because this was the, what they were doing to get ready for the priesthood. We look over in John's account, in chapter 1, verse 19. This is where the Jews sent the priests and Levites from Jerusalem to find to talk to John. And these guys were already priests. And remember, everybody's coming out there, and to start the first step towards becoming a priesthood, these guys are the only priests. They want to know, well, these guys are coming out to, for, this, for taking the first step to be a priest. What's going on? Who is this guy out here? Comes out and says, this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and denied not, I, but confessed, I'm not the Christ. He asked him, but what then? Are thou Elias? He said, no, I'm not. Or not, I'm not. Are thou the prophet? He said, no. And he said, well, who art thou that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? They didn't know. He said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. Oh, they that were sent were of the Pharisees. So... They now knew that he was the one who was fulfilling the prophecy that was come forth in Isaiah chapter 40. 
Verse 25, they asked him and said, well, why baptize then if thou be not the Christ nor Elias? They thought that Christ was supposed to be doing the baptism and he is going to do one, but it's a, it's a baptism of the Holy Spirit. But John was doing something beforehand. Neither Elias, neither that prophet. John answered and said, I baptize with water. What was that? Because that was the first step for them to enter into the priesthood in the Old Testament era, as you will see. There standeth one among you whom you know not, though. He said, you don't know about this person. And who was that? That, of course, was Jesus. And so we come over to Matthew chapter 3. And we come down here to verse 11, where he says, I indeed baptize you with water and repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. This is the one who's coming, and he's talking about a different baptism the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and fire. Now, one of the things we have to realize is they were, they were, they were asking him who he was, but you know, they didn't ask him, why are you doing what you're doing? Because they knew what he was doing. They knew that he was doing what was necessary for them to come into the priesthood. Why do we know that? Here's the steps for coming into the priesthood. First of all, remember, that they said you're going to be a kingdom of priests, and now the kingdom's coming, that means everybody's going to be a priest. The full minute, fulfillment of this prophecy is going to happen. In Leviticus chapter 8, where the Lord spoke to Moses, he said, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments, and the anointing oil, and the bullock for the sin offering, two ams and a, rams, and a basket of unleavened bread. Gather all the congregation together into the door of the t tabernacle of the congregation. What are they doing? They're getting ready for the, him, them to come into the priesthood. Verse 5, Moses said to the congregation, this is the thing which the Lord commanded to be done. He brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. That was the first step to become a priest. That's why they were all coming out to be washed because they understood that the priesthood was going to be for everybody. So what's the first step? Come out to be washed. That's why they all came out to be baptized. This was the first step. What was the second step? Verse 12, he poured the anointing oil upon Aaron's head and anointed him to sanctify him. That was the second step. The anointing had to come upon him. And what's the third step? There had to be an application of the blood. It says in verse 22, he brought the other ram, the ram of consecration. Aaron and the son, sons laid their hands upon the head of the ram. He slew it and Moses took of the blood of it, put it upon the tip of Aaron's right ear thumb of his right hand, great toe of his right foot. Brought Aaron's sons. Moses put all the blood on the, upon the tip of their right ear, upon the thumbs of their right hands, upon the great toes of their right feet. And Moses sprinkled the blood upon the altar round about. So there was a washing, there was an anointing, and then there was the application of the blood. And what was the purpose for the application of the blood? It was cleansing. It was a cleansing from the sin, because they would sin with their ears, and with their hands, and with their feet. These were the three steps, washing, anointing, and the blood applied. Well, remember what we see. Let's go back now over to what we just looked at a moment ago in Matthew 3. Matthew 3, verse 11. He's washing. But now there's someone else coming who's going to be baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. That's Jesus. Now, verse 13, then comes Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. Why is Jesus coming to be baptized of John? Remember, John is signifying everybody's going to come into the priesthood, and he is the one who is bringing forth the first step, which was the washing. Now, look what happens. John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and thou comest to me. Jesus said, Suffer it be so now, for thus it, so cometh, th thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. What righteousness? The righteousness of the law, the steps to become a priest. That's why Jesus needed to be baptized, 
signifying that he was going to become the priest. And he suffered him. Jesus, when he was baptized, that's the washing, first step. Went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open to him. And what was the second step? The anointing, which would be the Holy Spirit. What happened? He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. That is the second step. And he heard a voice from heaven say, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. The anointing came upon him. What's the third step? It was the application of the blood. It had to be done in, with Jesus. When was it done? When he got to the cross. Matthew 27, 29. When they had plated, platted a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him. When they put that crown of thorns on, it dug into his skull. What would happen? The blood would spurt out and run down to the tip of the ear. What else? He got nailed to the cross. What would happen when the blood spurted out? It would get to the right thumb. And the feet, it would get to the great toe. The application of the blood was then upon him for the third part of the, what was necessary for him coming into the priesthood. So, the baptism, the washing, the anointing, and then the blood applied. Now, in order to see this come to pass, though, could Jesus become the high priest in the state that he was in in the Old Covenant era? No. Instead, there had to be a change. Why? Because Jesus was of the, not of the tribe of Levi. He was of the tribe of Judah. And furthermore, it said that everybody is going to become a priest. Well, that means it couldn't be under the Old Testament era. It had to be a change. The first thing that happened was there had to be, that we realized there had to be a change in the covenant. That was prophesied back in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 and following. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws in the inward parts and write them in their hearts, and I'll be, that will be their God, and they shall be to me my people. Well, when did this happen? This is the New Testament. It was exactly what's quoted in Hebrews chapter 8, where it speaks of this, this new covenant that came into being. Jesus actually spoke of this before he went to the cross in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 26 and following. He said here about when he took the bread, blessed it, break it, gave the disciples, said, take, eat, this is my body. Took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to him, saying, drink ye all of it. What's he doing? He's showing the fact there's a change from, from the Passover Seder and the, to now the communion that was going to be the memorial in the New Testament era. This is my blood of the New Testament. And remember what it shed for, for many into the release and from bondage and imprisonment of sins. I mean, you're not going to be a sinner any longer. You're going to be set free by his blood that was going to be shed not only to accomplish the redemption, but it also had another effect. The blood was going to ratify the New Testament that was going to come into being. Now, not only had there be a new covenant, but there also had to be a new priesthood because the priesthood was after the order of Aaron. And who were the priests? Only the tribe of Levi. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11 tells us, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? There wouldn't be any reason, would there? But obviously the Levitical priesthood could not bring perfection, so there had to be a new order of the priesthood. Verse 12, well, the priesthood being changed, <clears throat> it was changed. No longer was it the priesthood under the order of Aaron. It was now the priesthood under the order of Melchizedek. And also, there's made of necessity a change of the law. That's why we're not under the Old Testament law. 
We're under the New Testament law of Christ now. Unfortunately, so many still follow the Old Testament law in error. He of whom these things were spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance to the altar. <laughs> Talking about Jesus. <laughs> Verse 14, For it's evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. He wasn't the tribe of Levi. Of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Yet it's more, far more evident that after the similitude of Melchizedek there arises another priest, a new order of the priesthood, Melchizedek, who was a king and a priest, which is what Jesus is going to become and what you and I become as well, who is made not after the law of a carnal command, but after the power of an endless life. For he testified, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Uh, the order of Aaron is replaced. There is a change now in the priesthood. We come down to verse 20. Insomuch as not without an oath he was made priest, for those priests that were made without an oath, but with, with this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. It was changed. Verse 23. They truly were many priests. They were not suffered to continue by reason of death. You know, they would die out. But this man, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. There isn't any change. He is the priest continually because he has, of course, an endless life. So, not only was there a change in the covenant, a change in the priesthood and the order of it, but also there was a change in the way you come into the priesthood. Remember that they had to be born of the tribe of Levi. It was by physical birth. Well, there was going to be a change. And what was that change? It was going to be a change by spiritual birth. That's why he speaks of this change of how you come into the priesthood when he said, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. This is a spiritual priesthood that you enter into by a spiritual baptism, which brings you into, of course, being born again and brings you into the body of Christ. We go back to seeing how this relates to the baptism because in Luke chapter 12, we'll look at two places, Luke chapter 12 verse 50, Jesus makes this statement, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straightened till it was accomplished? This isn't talking about the baptism with water, it already happened, now he's talking about a different baptism that Jesus is to be baptized with. He explains it more fully, it's explained in Matthew's account. Matthew chapter 20, verse 22. Jesus answered, and this is when they were talking about who would be the sit on the right hand or the left, and he answered their question. You not know what you ask. Are you able to drink? Uh, he says, you know, you know not what you ask. Then he makes a statement after that. He says, are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of? What cup was that? The cup of death and to be baptized with a baptism that I am baptized with. Well, that's going to be a baptism that's going to occur after he drank the cup of death. They say unto him, we're able. He responds, he says, you shall drink indeed of my cup. That means not only was Jesus going to experience a death, but they were going to experience a death too. That means mankind was going to die that's right, because every one of us have to die, and we did die, and be baptized with a baptism that I am baptized with. Well, that means we're going to have the same, we're going to have a death, and we're also going to have the baptism that he's baptized, baptized with, which is what? A baptism that is going to take old spirit out and bring a new spirit in. Because remember what it said, we have to go back for a moment, when he talked about this baptism, it's a baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. What's the fire do? The fire burns something up and consumes it. What has to happen? The old spirit has to be eliminated. It dies and it is eliminated and that's the fire burning up and consuming the old spirit. Now let's get a picture of this over in Romans chapter 6. The new way coming into the priesthood. Remember, he said, you're going to die. You're going to drink this cup just like I am. Jesus died. 
He died spiritually. He was made sin with all of our sins, separated from the Father when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was spiritually dead. He went down to hell for three days and three nights, just like mankind was spiritually dead all along. He was, because he's a sinner. Jesus had to get in the same position that mankind is in to accomplish the redemption, being spiritually dead, which he did. He paid the price for the three days and three nights. And then what happened? He was baptized by the Holy Spirit and raised from spiritual death to spiritual life. The old spirit was taken out of him and a new spirit came into him because Jesus was the first one born a firstborn from spiritual death and the spiritual life. You'll see this in a moment. Now, in, do, in, so, in doing so, look what it says here. How shall we who died to the sin? We died. When did we die? Well, we died when the baptism of the Holy Spirit occurred because the old spirit was taken out and eliminated. He goes on and says, Know ye not? As many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, that's the born-again experience, baptism by the Holy Spirit, not water baptism, the baptism by the Holy Spirit into Jesus Christ, which is what happens when we get born again into the body of Christ. We were baptized into his death. Well, what was his death? His death was the removal of that old spirit, and the new spirit then comes in is what he got, and you and I get the same thing. He goes on and says, Therefore we are buried with him, or buried together with him, by baptism unto death. Just as he was baptized unto death, we are baptized unto death. When does that happen? It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because what happens? When the Holy Spirit comes upon us, the old spirit is taken out and burned up, and a brand new spirit comes into us. That is, what, that is what happens when we're saved. Remember, we become a new creation. The old is passed away, the old spirit. The new comes into us. When it talks about old things, we'll jump over to that for a moment. In 2 Corinthians, it's not talking about all things in all aspects of your life. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. This is the word for creation, actually. Old things are passed away where? In spirit. Did you get a new mind, will, and emotions, soul? No. Did you get a new body? No. What'd you get? A brand new spirit and a brand new heart. That's what we got. Behold, that the old one is taken away. It's gone. It's eliminated. It's gone. It perished. It's eliminated. Behold, all things are become new, brand new, kainos, recently made, never existed before, because what did we get? We got a brand new spirit that came into us and a new heart that came on the inside of us. That actually was prophesied back in the Old Testament by Ezekiel, what would happen to us. See, you have to, under, in chapter 36, that is, verse 26, a new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. The heart is the inner man. The spirit is the spirit of Christ that comes and dwells in that new heart, that new inner man. And then we receive the Holy Spirit who comes in afterwards. That's the next verse. I will put my spirit within you. That's the receiving of the Holy Spirit to come and dwell on the inside of you. Now, let's go back for a moment we said there was a new way into the priesthood. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 5 says, Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest. He didn't do anything. God's the one who brought him into it. But he that said to him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. That means born you. Otherwise, how did he become a high priest? He was born to become a high priest. Well, how was Jesus born to become a high priest? He was born from spiritual death unto spiritual life. Acts chapter 13, 
Verse 33. God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children in that he hath raised up Jesus again. As it's written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I born you, fathered you. He raised him up again. Well, that's talking about after he was dead. Well, how did he raise him up again? He was born. Well, that means when Jesus was spiritually dead in hell, the way he he came out of there was he got born by the Father. We see this shown also over in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5. Look what it says. For to which of the angels said at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, born you. And again, this means at another time, a repetition of the action. This has happened again at a later time. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Because he got born, he was dead, separated from the father, and now he becomes back into relationship with God as his father and becomes a son because he got born again, born from the father. Look what also he says. We can tell that, the, that this is so because it says again, when he bringeth in the first begotten, the firstborn. Who is Jesus? The firstborn from the dead when he got a brand new spirit into the world. Is this talking about when he came from heaven into the world? No. This is when he came from hell into the earth because it means the inhabited earth. He brought the firstborn. Where was he born? Firstborn? Down in hell. He came back into the inhabited earth. This is when Jesus was first was born from spiritual death to spiritual life. And we see this declared and Colossians 1.15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creation. The word for creation or every creature, one that's been created. Young's brings it out of each creation. And then what else do we see about him? Verse 18, he's the head of the body of the church, which is the beginning, the firstborn, and where was he born from? Not from, but out of, where? The dead. Well, that can't be when he came from heaven because he, had, there wasn't, he wasn't with the dead in heaven. He was with the Father in heaven. The Word came flesh. This is talking about him being first born out of the dead. Well, where were all the dead people? In hell, spiritually dead. And this isn't talking about out of death. Some people have thought, well, I thought this was about out of death. No, it's talking about out of the dead people. How do we know? Because this is the word nekron, which means the dead, and it's plural. So it's talking about all the dead people. Where were all they? They were all in hell. Where was Jesus born, first born, born spiritually? It was from where out of all the dead people. That's where it all happened. Jesus is the firstborn from the dead, praise God. And in doing so, remember, it was the Holy Spirit who did this work because Romans chapter 8, verse 11 says, if the Spirit of Him, that's the Holy Spirit, that raised up Jesus out of the dead. Wow, that tells us something. Here it is, out of the dead people, plural. Who raised him up out of the dead? The Holy Spirit. Well, how did the Holy Spirit raise him up out of the dead? He, he was immersed in the presence of the Holy Spirit, which is what baptism means, remember. And the Holy Spirit caused him to be born, the firstborn, out of the dead. He was spiritually born from spiritual death into spiritual life. Remember, he was baptized into death, and then he came, was baptized unto life, being the firstborn from spiritual death unto spiritual life. And this is so, who did it? It's the Holy Spirit who did it. He raised up Jesus out of the dead. Well, that's the Holy Spirit baptism or immersing or submerging in the very presence of God. And remember this immersing or presence of the whole being is what produces the new birth in us. We saw that before when we talked about Titus chapter 3. 
in verse 5, where it talks about how he saved us by the washing means the bathing. That's the whole person. That's how, if we were immersed and submerged totally by the presence of God, it's like we've been bathed in the presence of, of the Holy Spirit. The bathing of what? The new birth. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is what produces the new birth. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is what brought us into the body of Christ. It's the one spiritual baptism, remember. Now, once we've come into that, and we now have, he, he's the firstborn, what did he do? He, he's the one who came into the priesthood now. He's the one that's now the high priest. And what about you and me? Oh, well, that's how we come into the priesthood by spiritual birth just as well. And we see it over in Revelation chapter 1, over here in verse 5. From Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten, firstborn, out of, ek, the dead people, plural. He's the firstborn and the ruler of the kings of the earth now, unto him that loved us. And what did he do in loving us? He paid the price and accomplished the redemption. He's the one who got the new spirit for us, firstborn from the dead. So we got a new spirit, the spirit of Christ, that we can receive. And what did he do in order to bring us into that same position? He bathed us. That's the word luo. That is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He bathed us from, this is this word for the separation, from a state of separation as, uh, go back to that one here, from the separation of the union fellowship with something else by the destruction of what it was, which was what? From being a sinner. We're not a sinner any longer. We've got a brand new spirit on the inside of us. So he bathed us from that position of being a sinner and from being in bondage to sins, remember. How did he do it? In his own blood, by paying the price. So you and I, and what else did he do? This talks about us being born again. And then it says, and he's made us kings and priests unto God. That means we've come into the priesthood. But this is not just being a priest only. This is a twofold priesthood. Just as Jesus became a king and a priest, he's the king of kings, and he's the high priest over the covenant, the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, who was the king of Salem, and he was a priest of the Most High God, both. In like manner, you and I are kings and priests unto God. Remember what it talks about over in 1 Peter? Or excuse me, yeah, 1 Peter. Chapter 2, verse 5. You as lively stones built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. We're a priesthood now. Holy that minister to him, offering up spiritual sacrifices unto the Lord. Then verse 9 talks about us being a royal priesthood. There's two aspects to the priesthood, a holy priesthood and a royal priesthood. The royal priesthood are who? The ones who are the kings, the ruling, reigning, royal, kingly priesthood. That's what you and I are. We now are kings and priests unto God. You're a king. You've been brought into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. By the way, as we pointed out, oh, those, that minority text has really messed people up. It's the false translation, remember. The Scrivener's is the is Texas Receptus basis where it says we are kings, plural, and priests, plural. Well, if you look at Westcott and Hort, the basis for all the minority text ones, the ESV, the NAU, the NIV, the NLT, all these ones. It doesn't say you're kings, singular. It says you're now a kingdom. We're not a kingdom. What? There's only one kingdom. It's the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Since when are we now become a kingdom? 
separate from him? No. We're kings under the king of kings in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. These guys say we're a kingdom. Priests. And that's why you see the other translations. Here's the NAU. He's made us to be a kingdom. Are we a kingdom? No. We're kings in the only kingdom that's, that reigns, which is the kingdom of Jesus Christ. The ESV says you've made us a kingdom. No. We're not a kingdom. In fact, if anything, that sounds like we're a different kingdom than what, what Jesus has. Made us a kingdom? No. Because what are we brought into? Colossians 1.13, remember it says, we've been translated into what? The kingdom of his dear son. The kingdom of Jesus Christ. And we are kings under the king of kings. So we're not a kingdom. Everybody who reads those translations will never know that they're kings. They'll think they became a kingdom, which is a lie. Man hasn't become his own kingdom. No, he's become kings in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Now we are kings. Now, in light of all this, this tells us there's a change in the covenant, Old Testament to the New Testament. There's a change in the priesthood, priesthood of Aaron to the priesthood of Melchizedek, who's a king and a priest. There's a change now in the way into the priesthood, not just one tribe, but everybody can come in, as far as who's it's available for. And there's also a, a, ch a change in the way now this, we come into this priesthood because the Old Testament was by physical birth. The New Testament, we come in by what? Spiritual birth. He's the firstborn. We are born spiritually into this kingdom. That's how we've come into it. And coming into that kingdom is the first, we come into what? The body of Christ. And how did we come into the body of Christ? By the baptism of the Holy Spirit, as we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. All these things are talking about the spiritual baptism of the Holy Spirit that brought us into one body. That's how we came into the priesthood. That's how we are born into it now. That's why he says, that I'm baptizing you with water, the first step at this one. Instead, Jesus is going to baptize you by the Holy Spirit. That's how you're going to come into the kingdom. And what's the baptism of the Holy Spirit? It brings us into the one body. It's the new birth. When we get born from spiritual death unto spiritual life, and we come to that place. And what are we a part of? The real church. And what is the real church? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 23. He says, To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, or more literally, church of firstborns. There is no the. There's no definite article in the Greek. We'll show you. Here it talks about in... Uh, that's so 20, I said we're 23 we have to look at. Here's the word for church. Church, then after that there would be a definite article if there was, but there isn't. The next word is this, which is firstborn. And by the way, is it church of the firstborn singular? Talking about Jesus? No, because it's plural. What it's saying is the church of firstborns, which means all of us. What is the real church? the church of firstborns. You and I are a part of the only church that God recognizes, the church of firstborns. There is no other church. If you want to say, what's the name of the church? It's the church of firstborns. <laughs> That's what you call it. You and I have come into it, and we've come into the priesthood. So now, there's a brand new priesthood, and we're kings and priests. It's the spiritual priesthood. We've come in by spiritual birth into that and into the church, which is the body of Christ. And how do we get into it? By the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and you're going to see this in, as we go through some of these other verses, 
is how all these talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, except for a few that talk about baptism with water, and we'll be pointing out what they're all about. And when we truly see what's being said, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is what it's talking about time after time after time. Here in Galatians chapter 3, it's what it's speaking of in verse 27. For as many as you have, have been baptized, Passive voice, by the way, which means it's by someone else, which would be by God, into ice. Come, that means now you've come into Christ. Have put on. They, you have put on yourself, Christ. You put on. You, that's what's happened because now you have. Uh, when you came into Christ, now you have Christ in you. You have the Spirit of Christ in you. Because what happens when you get born again? You get the Spirit of Jesus Christ. We know that. from He speaks about that in Galatians chapter 4, verse 6, about what we get. Because your sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son. That's the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Into your hearts. The brand new heart you got, remember. Crying, Abba, Father. We now have the Spirit of Jesus Christ. In fact, that's the first thing you get. If you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you don't even belong to Him. It says that even in Romans 8, verse 9. Look what it says. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. That's what you get when you're born again. Then you receive the Holy Spirit after that. First you get the Spirit of Jesus Christ, then you get the Holy Spirit who comes to dwell on the inside of you. So, the washing is in what happens with all these things. The baptism of the Holy Spirit produces the whole deal. It's the immersing or the washing. We're engulfed and we become brand new on the inside of us. The anointing comes because what does Christ mean? It means the anointed one the anointed one comes into us. And what else happens? Remember it says we're rem the remission of sins, the release from bondage and prison of sins, which means we're no longer a sinner. And how did that happen? Remember we were bathed, the separation out of sins, meaning our sins that we committed as a sinner in spirit, in the state we were in, they're washed away, they're eliminated, they're all gone because we're not a sinner any longer. You get a brand new spirit. Your spirit doesn't sin. Well, how do you sin? You sin with your soul and or your body, not your spirit. It's eliminated. So, and how did that happen? The blood washed away your sins from the spirit. It eliminated them. It's gone. That's why we see... In the baptism of the Holy Spirit, all three are done in one shot to bring you into the, into the priesthood. You're baptized with the Holy Spirit. You get a brand new spirit. The anointed one comes into you. You're now no longer a sin under the bondage of sins. You don't sin in your spirit. It's washed away by the blood. It's gone. Now, that's, can't say, that doesn't say you can't sin. You still can from your soul and body, but your spirit does not sin. The Spirit of Christ doesn't sin. The Holy Spirit who comes to dwell in, in you, He doesn't sin either. Where do you sin from? From the body where it dwells in it and or from your soul, will, intellect, and emotions yielding to the wrong thing, of course. So, you can see all three are fulfilled of the washing, the anointing, and the, the blood applied to get you cleansed the whole person, remember, it was the tip of the ear, the ear, and the feet, that really speaks of the whole person. That's what happens when you're bathed. The whole person, you are a, no longer a sinner, and the sins of the spirit are eliminated. You're not a sinner. Now you have the righteous spirit, the spirit of Christ. So therefore, it's all been done in one shot. The baptism of the Holy Spirit brings you into the priesthood. And now we are in the New Testament priesthood as kings and priests unto God. Praise God. we got a lot more to talk about, and we're going to be going through other scriptures that will be important to understand. 
that we'll see how they relate to, they're the, talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and we understand them correctly, as well as we'll get to talking about water baptism scriptures and what the purpose of that is as well. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you for the work of God in the aspect of the baptism of the Holy Spirit that brings us into the priesthood. I see there's a change from the old covenant to the new covenant, from the old priesthood of Aaron to the new priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. I see the way into the priesthood changed from physical birth to spiritual birth. And I see the requirements of becoming a priest, the washing, the anointing, and the application of the blood is all fulfilled in the baptism of the Holy Spirit that brings forth the new birth, the new creation, the anointing, the anointed one, no longer a sinner. We don't sin in our spirit any longer. Thank you for this great work that Jesus Christ accomplished to bring us to the remission of sins, no longer a sinner, bring us to the new creation, the church of firstborns in relationship with God as our heavenly father, having a brand new spirit through spiritual birth and be kings and priests unto God. Thank you for this great work that you've accomplished. I praise you for it. And I'm going to share it with others so that they will come into the same thing through receiving Jesus, being born again through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for this great work you've accomplished in the body of Christ. For me personally, every one of us, thank you. And you've made it for all mankind. They need to be baptized by the Holy Spirit and be a firstborn. Come out of spiritual death unto spiritual life. Thank you, Father, for this great work you've accomplished. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Father, I thank you for helping everybody to understand this and get rid of these, this attitude of thinking the baptism of the Holy Spirit is after you're born again, which is a lie, and that all these scriptures refer to water baptism, which they have nothing to do with. It all has to do with Holy Spirit baptism that accomplishes this great work of bringing the, the remission, eliminating being a sin, sinner, and also bringing us into the priesthood, the spiritual priesthood, kings and priests, and relationship with you, and coming in to be a part of the church of firstborns. Thank you for this great work. Thank you for this revelation, and we will share it with others in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Well, Sunday we're going to start talking about some of these other scriptures. We're going to be talking about Mark 16, 16. You're going to see the truth about that. We're going to be talking about Acts chapter 8 and Acts chapter 19, and you're going to see some things that you haven't seen before, I'm sure. We're also going to be talking about water baptism scriptures and understanding what's the purpose of water baptism and why is it important and why is it something that is necessary and what does it show before God and how do you carry out what you have done in water baptism before God throughout your life. So you'll be preserved and protected and fulfill the things that God has. We'll talk all about that and we'll be talking about that on Sunday. Praise God. Well, God bless. I trust this has helped you and have a wonderful week. If you might have prayer, want prayer, come forward.